Hi, uh, Maddie and Eli. Uh, Daddy here again. Um, I really hope you guys are incredibly well. This doesn't look like changing anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, I said a few vlogs ago uh, about how I'd been working on uh, something about our situation. Um, and I hoped to get it finished by your seventh birthday. This is, of course, entirely true, but I thought maybe because nothing's going on, we can't do anything, I thought maybe I might release the first half of it. Um, this was filmed uh, from the minute I was extracted out of your life. Um, I began this. And I, it's been filmed all around the world. And yes. So this is part one. Daddy loves you always. Mwah. I'm your dad, Daddy. I love you and want to be with you, but unfortunately that isn't the life you and I have or are unofficially allowed to. It's just not our time. I'll explain. But firstly, I must apologize for having to do it in this way. If there had been any other way, I would have done that instead. Firstly, and most importantly, I am your father. And I love you, and can and want to provide for you, and make you happy, and develop your character and skills, and show you wonderful things, and take you to wonderful places, and have fun, and create beautiful memories, and show you constellations, and how tennis sing high seas, and make jokes about everything and just generally be dad. The important stuff, in other words. There is a room in my house for you. It is filled with yours and your half-sister's cards and presents for all the lost celebrations and, indeed, much, much more. It's a really, really cool room. And there are videos on here YouTube and also the movies I make for you and the books that I write for you. Creating a life for you because we are not together. But let's start at the beginning. When parents separate, they agree upon certain things. Things such as 
being morally right by the child, you. And important promises were made. I will never stop you seeing your son, was one such promise. Do you think something so important can mean so little? Sometimes, and this has to do with love, uh, on which more later, one has to simply believe these things. I knew your sister before I knew your mother. This is not a sentence many people get to say. The unusual is broadly true. That's a safe assumption. Which is why, if it sounds like journalism, it is probably false. Your sister Maddie was in my ballet class. I say my ballet class, but obviously I was the accompanist, not the actual ballet teacher. Then one day, so I was told, uh, an instrument for her to learn had to be decided upon, and she picked piano. This may all be apocryphal, but it's my history, and thus mine to tell. She apparently then said that she'd only have me, her ballet class accompanist, teach her at home. I remember the exact moment your mother and I first met. It was here, in this hall. Or perhaps it was in here, the back room of the same church that I now ironically work at as music director of the opera company next door. The cast of our Carmen! <laughs> Apparently, some of the parents at the West Hampstead School of Dance were calling us boyfriend and girlfriend before we'd even been properly introduced. So I guess there was chemistry. When we did get to know each other, the attraction was unbelievable. We could barely hold a coherent conversation. Thus, I found myself a few days later, briefly leaving a party that I was throwing in my flat in Notting Hill to deliver a piano keyboard to your sister so that she could begin learning. I'll always keep it for you, by the way. Despite the extraordinary something between your mum and me, nothing would have happened had it not been for that simple gesture with the piano keyboard. So, after a separation, the first port of call, if the parents are not in agreement, which we were, but I, we agreed not to go to court for the sake of you children, quickly dawned on me that that was a ruse. Um, the first port of call in this situation is mediation, which I applied to and I have kept all these documents for you to prove that I did. So that was step one. That was instantly rejected, with no explanation as to why. That should have been a warning sign. Now, as a father, it's natural that I should want you to be more intelligent than me. And this wasn't my best moment. Never fall for this. I was informed that a Ma-Rec meeting would take place on a certain date. I, being homeless, as I had left the family home when asked to, without argument, as a reasonable man should, and of course being without the internet or temporarily a job because it's next to impossible to work when one is homeless. Stupidly assumed that this meant marriage reconciliation, Marek. It, it seemed a logical assumption. However, like most assumptions, it was a stupid one. A quick um, aside, incidentally I could have enforced my marital rights and stayed in the family home, which would have given you more of a chance at actually having a father, although of course with all the promises I, I didn't think it necessary, plus to have done so, to have enforced that, I would have had to have not been the person I am. I would have had to be a controlling, forceful, well, that's all I guess. Um, and all the evidence is to the contrary. I, I didn't do that. I now know it's a community meeting where a bunch of strangers whom you've never met, who don't know you, of you, or anything about you, get to decide your future and that of your children's. And if the mother says you can't attend, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. This is really not normal. And uh, it's MARAC. The acronym is M-A-R-A-C, 
which stands for Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference. Except, bizarrely, there's no actual agency involved because social services have no part in it, nor do any child protection agency, nor the police, nor anyone else. So, and then of course, as I mentioned before, I suddenly wasn't allowed to attend uh, this incredibly important meeting about your future and my future, but most importantly yours. This was only announced the day before the meeting, which we'd all been in agreement about, or of course so I believed, which of course the day before gave me no time to either cancel, arrange, or even query what was going on. I, I did suggest, can we arrange another one for me? They said, no. Nope. I said, can I ask why I'm not allowed to attend? They said, yes, if the mother of the child says you're not allowed to attend, then you're not allowed to attend. We will decide his future and yours for you. More on this later about fathers in this country having little to no rights. So, mediation was refused without any explanation as to why. The Marak meeting went ahead without me. Um, and still, the promises continued. I will never stop you seeing your son. I'm not pushing you out. It will all be sorted with this new thing. The independent adjudicator. I want it to be sorted. I would like a break now and again, was the promise then given. As is all completely understandable when one becomes a parent. Great. Brilliant, I thought. We should perhaps mention that one of your mother's hand-picked representatives at this Marak meeting was an alcoholic Catholic priest. Look to that insane institution for its support of systematic child abuse. Actually, I really shouldn't knock the Catholic Church because it's one of my top five favourites. Top five favourite organisations for clandestine global evil. The horror! So now we embarked upon the farce of the independent adjudicator, who sat in a coffee shop with me in Camden Town and calmly informed me that, although she had absolutely no connection to any government body, officially, she could tell me that I was not allowed to see you, my son. I asked, so how are you allowed to say this to me? Who are you? It is how it is. You cannot. Why and who are you? I cannot tell you that. Can you tell me who you work for? Are you from social services? No, I am not from the SS. Then how on earth can you tell me this abhorrent stuff? I do not have to say, nor am I permitted to. How is this fair? I am fair. I am the independent adjudicator. But you've heard nothing from my side because I wasn't allowed to attend the Marak meeting. I do not need to hear anything from you. I have made my decisions. So if you're not government, then who on earth are you? I am the independent adjudicator. Jesus Christ. Of course. And also, of course, one can't get angry at this utter injustice because then you're instantly labelled aggressive and unreasonable, belligerent and controlling. And that instantly plays into their hands. It's what they want. It's a little bit like being trapped in an Escher drawing or a Kafka novel, or perhaps in an elastic sense, a Catch-22. So, after a great many more minutes of this stultifying drivel with the independent adjudicator, it transpired that in the Marak meeting that I had not conveniently been allowed to attend, I had suddenly been labelled violent, an addict, mentally ill, indeed, sectioned. The horror. A quick aside, any professional singing teacher will tell you that any form of mental illness or substance abuse is instantly identifiable in the singing voice. Well, simply take a listen to my professional recordings for you. I should add that I have also, from this time, 
kept copies of all the doctor's letters, all the doctor's test results and everything that proved this was a pack of lies. Not that it made any difference whatsoever, except in the future for you to prove it was lies. And there were other more sinister and disturbing things that came to light from the whole independent adjudicator situation. For example, your sister, who was then seven, was allowed to be interviewed by this totally unofficial adult. I have the transcript of this tub-thumping and awful interview filled with leading psychological questions. And in this, your sister expressed great sorrow that I hadn't bothered sending her a birthday or Christmas card the December after your mother and I split up in the August. Except for one small problem. I had. Clearly, it was considered just fine and dandy to let a seven-year-old girl, who had already been torn from one father, and who had been calling me dad for over two years, and with whom I'd lived as father and daughter for that time, to let her believe that I had merely, simply, disappeared out of her life without so much as a single backward glance. Personally, I think that's awful. I think that's child abuse. I also think it's deeply disturbing to think that a child's future can be decided by a group of community people, members with no expertise, no official government representation, and no recognition by the police or court system. But I didn't know that. I had no idea what this game was or how to play it. Unlike, of course, people who had done the exact same thing before. This happens to children every day in Britain. But, moving forward, I proved via official NHS medical notes that I had not been sectioned, nor do I suffer or have ever suffered from any mental illness. Although, even if I had, that would not disqualify me from being a good father. One should not discriminate against anyone based on health or wealth or skin colour or sexual orientation or any other reason. In a spirit of leaving no stone unturned, I also procured a letter from the Metropolitan Police because they were alleged to have arrested me to take me to be sectioned, stating that no such event ever took place. And of course I have kept all these official and legally binding documents because I know that even in the face of incontrovertible proof, one can still just completely deny and deny and deny. And let's not forget how astoundingly good human beings are and making up lies and convincing themselves that they are true. And then, of course, trying to convince everyone else around them that the same lies are the gospel truth. This is why belief is the most overrated virtue. Hilariously, if your life was a black comedy, laughter in the dark, I'm DBS checked and work in schools all the time, which means that the government, the police, and all teachers in this country consider me perfectly fine, fit and able to work with children. But my own children cannot benefit. The only children I cannot be with are my own. This is not normal. Indeed, when I went as part of my work to your sister's school with three other musicians to give an opera presentation to children, your sister was forced to be absent for the day. And Unbelievably, the school didn't even question this. So mediation was refused without any explanation as to why. My attendance was not allowed at the Marak meeting without any explanation as to why. The independent adjudicator could give me no information at all with no explanation as to why, except that I couldn't see my son. You. So, for a while, I simply just tried turning up and asking to see you. Unfortunately, uh, for you, and for me, but especially for you, despite only one visit, this was instantly construed to the authorities and made out to be harassment. Indeed, stalking. So I couldn't do that anymore. I could not come to simply see my son. 
One might be forgiven for thinking that in a civilised country, um, the right of a parent to see their child, especially when the parent has done nothing provably wrong or been a bad parent, you would think that would be paramount. But you'd be wrong. I then filed a C-104 at the Central Family Courts for access to you and Maddie. As a father, I do not discriminate between your sister Maddie, who happens to have a different father, and you. I promised her that when I became her father, and that didn't change when I became yours. I will always stand by that, and as a man, you will one day understand, if not entirely respect, that decision. The C-100 form was instantly rejected because I'm not biologically Maddie's father. And of course, I've kept these documents for you to prove that I did things in the right way. Subsequently, I did not contest a non-molestation order put forward by your mother suddenly uh, to the courts. Oddly, despite the fact that I hadn't contacted your mother in over three months since the whole independent adjudicator fiasco. Which I was still hugely mystified about. Suddenly and alarmingly, she printed out various selected texts we'd had during an argument six or seven months earlier and presented them as evidence of me being horrible. I honestly couldn't have been less prepared for this nonsense. My mother had just died, uh, I was homeless, I wasn't allowed my possessions, let alone a suit to wear. How could I have been prepared? But my thinking was, if one gives the aggrieved party what they want, then they may soften an approach, and perhaps they will do what they promised. Which was, as always, I will never stop you seeing your son. But I was stupid again, of course. It turned out that often when I'd leave to go to work, the police would be called and informed that a huge argument had taken place. Thus, police files exist, I have copies of them, but I knew nothing of it at the time and was justifiably baffled when they were produced in court. I was never, not once, questioned by the police or informed of any of this. Every single report I have reads no action taken and I knew nothing of it at all. And all of this is checkable and provable. I then applied for supervised contact in a government centre. Supervised, mind, um, despite the fact I hadn't actually done anything wrong. Supervised by social workers who are there to make sure I don't abuse you or um, torch the place or set up a meth lab, start ad-libbing comedy routines, turn up with a crocodile or a tiger, etc. This, too, was rejected instantly. What, really, can one do? Men should not force women to do things they don't want to do. This is sound, it's a fact. But, in order to be a father, I was forced to at least try to bend those rules. I had to, I'm sorry, try to bend those rules for you and Maddie, because you guys are, and always will be, worth it. It didn't work, but funnily, laughter in the dark again. It was precisely by not being controlling, the word always thrown out against men, that forced me to try to become controlling. One day you'll see a fantastic film called The Shawshank Redemption. There's a line in that film that's very appropriate here. It goes, on the outside, I was an honest man, straight as an arrow. I had to come to Shawshank to be a crook. Incidentally, after denying the birthday and Christmas cards, I have a dictated court document that states that your three tortoises would have been disposed of unless I collected them. I did not willingly take yours and Maddie's pets. I had to, after that dictated email by the solicitor. But then, even more laughter in the dark, I was not allowed to collect them. But luckily, I managed to 
get an ex-girlfriend to rescue them. They are all alive, living well, and waiting for you. Georgie! But I'll bet good money that your sister was told I'd taken him simply to be mean, like the Christmas cards. We live in Britain, where this kind of stuff is the norm. In America, they would be considered child abuse, and rightly so. You can't be a good father if you have to have people dragged away screaming every time you want to see your children. And what kind of a man would that make me if I enforced it? If indeed the police would even do it. And why would they? I wouldn't if I was one of them. The best retribution is to save in every sense. Your torts are here for you. Just imagine though for one second how it would have looked legally in court if I as a male had threatened to kill family pets. This is a further example of the shameless inequality within the British family courts. This is of course not an excuse to dislike women that would be the height of bad manners, not to mention stupidity. It's not their plural fault, and only very few choose to abuse the system in this way. Most mothers want a loving father for their children. Indeed, they think their children deserve a loving father. And only very few choose to reject that and choose victimhood again and again and again. But, let me pose a question. I have known all kinds of men in my time. I have known violent ones. I had a dreadful stepfather who has outlived both my real parents and who I note via Facebook has now got God the horror. Well, of course he has. Forgiveness gets him off the hook every time. <laughs> One of his favourite habits was sauntering over while I was practising the piano and when he was satisfied I was suitably distracted, slamming the lid on my fingers. I'm sorry to say his treatment of my mother was of a similar ilk. These guys don't beat up two wives and then go on to enjoy a blissful, calm third marriage. That isn't reality. Sure, your mum and I split up, but ask yourself this. Why have none of us, her ex-partners, had problems with anyone else? One of my ex-girlfriends is in your movie, and uh, several of my ex-girlfriends sent letters to the court to, because they cared about you being allowed to have a father. My favourite of these was from a Canadian academic friend of mine, uh, whose friend had actually beaten up his wife and been a dreadful man and the said wife still um, made time for him to see his son because she realised, as a mother, it's incredibly important. The ex-girlfriends all said I was a normal partner. Not brilliant or awful, just perfectly normal. Many of my exes know each other and are friends, if not just acquaintances. Maddie's dad was forced to plead abuse, apparently. I was promised to look, but never actually saw the court papers, to plead abuse in order to see his daughter, your sister. I did not, and I will not, because I was not ever violent to your mother. Never. I even took a lie detector. I know lie detectors are not foolproof, but I took one nonetheless to add to the file for you. It is untrue, though, that they can't be used in courts. In certain circumstances, they can be. And don't get me started on the boyfriends uh, in between us husbands, um, who all apparently used to abuse her uh, in the flat above KFC on Kilburn High Road. Having now been through it myself, I certainly don't believe that Maddie's dad was anything like the brute he was made out to be. He was got rid of when Maddie was one. 
I was got rid of when you were one. And your grandfather Eric, your real grandfather, was got rid of when your mother was one.